Hi everyone and welcome. Today I have another old goodie for you. So I was going through the list of my old videos and I found this one and I thought this one is probably a really good video to put out. And the reason I'm saying that is that I'm talking about the reason for why we have cravings. Some of you already know this, but for some of you this is going to be new and it will explain why you are reacting the way you're reacting and I just want to tell you that there's absolutely nothing wrong with you. Having cravings is totally normal and basically our survivability depended on it. So I'm going to talk about that in, or I am talking about that in this video. So if you want to know, I just want to say that for some people it's really helpful just knowing that you you're a perfect human being, you are just the way that you have evolved and there's nothing wrong with you. It's the type of foods that we're feeding ourselves that makes this kind of go a little bit haywire, but the response is still perfect. It's exactly what your body needed it to be while you were evolving. So I hope you enjoy this one and I'll see if I can dig out another one for you as well. So I'm going to first start talking about what cravings are and how that works. And then in the end, I'm going to explain what you can do, how you can get rid of the cravings, because it is actually a lot easier than you may think. It's not easy to do, but it's quite simple in theory. And once you get through, it's actually not that hard. And you, m me personally, I was kind of gobsmacked and I was like, how on earth can it be that easy and why didn't I know that before? So I'm hoping that I will be able to to share that with you in a way that you will uh, understand and have some use of. Hi Sylvia, nice to have you here. Um, okay, so first I want to define a craving. So a craving is a strong desire for something. This is what the dictionary would tell us. So then we might want to ask ourselves, what is desire and where does it come from? So most of us would probably think that desire is something that we are born with. It's, um, it's just involuntary. It's like a pre-programmed software in our brain almost. We don't have a choice. It's just there and it will basically force us to eat whatever it is that we want to eat. The, the sugary stuff or the pizza or the hot dogs. So to some extent this is true, we have an ability to to form cravings, but I want to tell you one thing and this is really really important. A craving is actually a learned behavior and this is the best news because if we can learn something we can unlearn it and this is true for cravings and that is just that's so bloody brilliant. And I had never thought of that before. Somehow I thought that cravings are just there. It's just part of our normal physiology and it would just trigger me to do that. And people are basically born with different types of cravings because I've always had sugar cravings. Even as a child, I was always looking for the cookies and the sweet stuff and it's always just been with me. So I've never really questioned it, but it is actually a behavior that we have learned. So, and yesterday I gave you a good example of um, driving to work, for example. So I'm going to expand this a little bit. So you get into your car, the first day you start a new job, you drive to work and before you take off, you check on the map or you check your G GPS or whatever you're using, how to get there. And then you're paying attention, you're paying attention to where you go right, where you go left, road signs, other signs just set it so that you have an idea of where you're going. After a week or two, you might just get into your car and then you arrive at work and you have no clue what happened in between. And this is because you have repeated this behavior several times so that you have delegated this task to your lower brain or your reptilian brain or whatever you want to call it. And th this frees up your your consciousness to other things because in the beginning you were so focused on where to drive and not taking the wrong turn and so on and now you just do it consciously and you can uh, 
rather have a conversation with someone else in the car while you're driving or listening to podcast or whatever you're doing so you you're basically multitasking and this is the way we do multitasking we think that we have repeated so many times that we don't have to think about it anymore and then we can use our brain juice for something else so that's how that work and now driving to work doesn't necessarily have a reward attached to it but eating a donut for example has a huge reward attached to it so you're picking up the donut you're writing the donut and you get this dopamine release and you get this reward from eating it and this reward will make you learn you they will make you hyper learn things basically the learning process just speeds up so fast that if you ever seen I can use my dog as example. If I'm walking the same round every day with my dog and one day she's very food motivated, one day she will find something to eat under a certain bush. She will be back under that bush every single time we're going for a walk for probably months, even if she doesn't find anything after the first time she found something. And that's how we work. When we are rewarded and when it lights up our reward center, our brains will automatically just remember this because this is very important for our survival. And that is why we have this system. It has developed to motivate us. So imagine that we were never rewarded for anything. We probably wouldn't want to do anything. Uh, if, if we just hung out in our caves and we couldn't be asked to go and you know, hunt down food, we would starve to death. Or if no one could go out and collect, collect firewood, we might freeze to death in winter. So we have this little, we have this reward center so that we can motivate ourselves to do things that will increase our survival. And that's how that works. So in the brain, how this works is that I, I think I spoke about this yesterday, but I'll just give you a little recap. The reward center has a lot of dopamine receptors. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter, so it will be released on one end and it will attach to the dopamine receptors and this will make you feel uh, pleasure or satisfaction and it will make you feel really, really good. So that's how we obviously um, get motivated to keep doing what we're doing. When we feel the pleasure, we will keep repeating that behavior and do it over and over again. So when we then hyper learn things, that those things that give us a huge dopamine reward, we will do it automatically very quickly. So it will just be delegated to the lower brain, so we don't have to think about it. But back in our head, we always have a thought trigger. We usually don't think about that. Most of us just say, oh, I just ate. And they just started eating and I don't know what happened but there is always a thought triggering that so I'll, that could be thoughts like oh that looks good or hmm, I want cake I need something I'm really stressed I really need something I need to just relax or I had a really stressful day today I think I deserve this or everyone else can eat cake why, why shouldn't I, be? I'm, I I want to be normal like everyone else so those thoughts can actually act like triggers. So often we think of triggers as a visual trigger. We see the cake, but a lot of the time we have these thoughts in our head and they act as triggers because they are connected with the behavior of eating the donut or the cake or whatever it is. So what we call this is, we call it neural pathways in your brain. So this is just the connection between different nerve cells and it usually involves a whole bunch of them that are firing together so maybe an example that would be easier to understand is that if you are folding laundry for example and you're always singing when you're folding laundry eventually you have repeated this so many times that is going to come naturally you're not even going to think about it so whenever you start folding laundry you will also start singing and if you were folding laundry and someone was sleeping this so you couldn't sleep uh, so you couldn't sing 
you would still feel that urge to sing and it would pop up in your head and it would just keep, hello, why are we not singing? You should be singing. Because these nerve cells are so used to firing together that now they are almost like one, it's almost like one behavior, even though they're two separate behaviors. And this is how we link things together. So it might be that, let's see, say that you, you see a cake and then you think, hmm, I want that cake. So there's the thought that you're having. And as a response to that thought, you will eat the cake. So you see the cake, you think, I want that cake, and you eat the cake. So these three things are now linked together in your brain in this neural pathway, and they will all fire together. So whenever you see a cake, you will automatically have this thought, and then you will automatically go and eat it. But it doesn't have to start with you seeing the cake. It can just start with a thought that is very similar, or oh, I want cake, and you will want to go and seek out this cake, and you probably know where to find the cake. So this is how that works. And if you don't know anything about neural pathways, the best way of imagining it is almost like, imagine that you go into a very thick, dense forest and you have to go through that forest every day for a year. And in the beginning, it's going to be really hard work. You making your way through and eventually you will a path will form in the middle and nothing will grow on that path because you're stomping on it every day. And eventually it gets really easy to walk there because it's, uh, there's nothing in the way and that's perfect. And that's the, uh, the see, think and eat the cake scenario. You have thought it so many times that now there's a really strong connection of those, um, co those um, neurons firing together. You don't have to spend a lot of energy doing it. It just happens automatically. But then one day someone tells you that actually you don't have to walk the whole long way through the forest. If you just take off here, you will get there much quicker. And you're like, yeah, I suppose I could, but that's really hard work because, you know, there are lots of bushes and everything in the way and I have to start over from the beginning. And it's just really a pain in the ass. But on the other hand, once that's done, I will save a lot of time. So you take off and you start walking down that way instead. And then the beginning is going to take you a lot longer to get to your goal because of all the bushes and everything that's in the way. But once you've done it a certain amount of times, you have formed a new path. And the old path that you're no longer using is starting to grow over. And this is how it works in our brains. We need to, to interrupt that neural pathway that we have. So when we see the cake and we have the thought, we need to not eat the cake so that we, we can see and we can think but it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to eat the cake. So that's how we're interrupting that pathway. Instead, we choose to not eat the cake. So when we have done that enough times, that is going to be a different neural pathway. And you need to practice that to get that behavior in. So every time you have those three events together, you will, wake the, you will make the original pathway much, much stronger. But every time you say no to the cake, when you're not having the cake, you will build on that sidetrack, the other neural pathway, the one that will not necessarily, is not, uh, is not, I wouldn't say not connected to the cravings, but it, it doesn't lead you to eating the cake. So I hope that that was uh, understandable. Um, Another example that might be a good one for you, because most people have heard about Pavlov's dogs. And uh, if you haven't, I'll give you a quick recap. This uh, was an experiment and they had a bunch of dogs. And every time before they were feeding them, they rang a bell. And then they came out with the food and the dogs picked up on this pretty quickly. So they rang the bell and the dogs started drooling and then they gave them the food. So this is the same thing. Ringing the bell is when you see the cake. The drooling is when you have the thought, I want the cake. And then giving them the food is obviously when you're eating the cake. So there are those three things that are linked together into this neural pathway. 
And eventually they just rang the bell, the dogs were drooling, and they didn't give them the food. But they were still drooling, even though they didn't get the food. So this is the craving that the dogs are having, or that you are having. When you're ringing the bell, you get the craving, because you associate those two things together. So what they did was they just rang the bell and they didn't feed the dogs. And they did this a hundred times or so. And eventually the drool dried up. Eventually the dogs stopped drooling. And that means they had broken that pathway. So it had grown over again and there was a new pathway for the dogs. They, they didn't have to respond with drool to that because they no longer expected that food to, to happen. So this is really really interesting i'm not saying we are dogs but we do um, react the absolute same way as the dogs do so what i want to offer you here because it sounds really easy and i mean i could you could tie yourself to a chair and say okay i'm not going to have anything and i can't have anything while i'm tied up here because the dogs obviously didn't have a choice but you do have a choice so I just want to mention the prefrontal cortex a little bit as well. So that's our higher brain. The prefrontal cortex is what we are using to plan for things. And we are, that's the part of our brain that is involved in uh, delayed gratification as opposed to the, the reptilian brain or the lower brain, which is more uh, associated with the immediate gratification. So we can plan for things. We can plan for... I want to lose weight, so I'm going to go on this diet. And then in the end, I'm going to lose this much weight and I will get my reward then. That is the prefrontal cortex that is doing that. And often we want to use our prefrontal cortex to decide that we're not going to have any cake. But then the cake is in front of us and we start having this little voice here and we start having this discussion with ourselves about whether we should have or shouldn't have this cake. And almost every single time we're going to lose this discussion, the, the prefrontal cortex is going to lose because the cravings are so strong. And it's like, you eat that cake because you will get this dopamine release and you will feel so good and so on. So we need to use our prefrontal cortex to plan. And when I'm saying planning is plan whether you are going to have any sugar tomorrow or not. So I'm not saying plan to not have any sugar. So let's say you today you're sitting there and you really, really, really want that donut. But you're going to say to yourself, okay, you can have that donut, but you can have it tomorrow. And then you plan for tomorrow how much you're going to eat and when you're going to eat it. So you're not having it today because yesterday you decided you were not going to have any sugar today, but today you have those immense cravings. So you can plan for this, which lets you use your prefrontal cortex and puts your prefrontal cortex back in command of what you're actually doing. And that's what you want to do. You want to be conscious about what you're doing. You want your prefrontal uh, cortex to run the show. You don't want your primitive brain to run the show because then you're just going to give in to all this uh, instant gratification every single time. So have have everything planned out. If you want to eat 10 donors tomorrow, that is fine, as long as you let your prefrontal cortex decide that 24 hours ahead. And then you just have those donors if you want them. If you do not want them the next day, you don't have to eat them. So it's also Im important you try to be realistic in how much of these donuts you can you know you can eat so if you say i'm just going to have half a donut and then you know that you're setting yourself up for failure because you're definitely going to have at least three then you're just ruining for yourself because then you have made a commitment to not have them but then you're giving in to your old ways of eating anyway and then you kind of ruin that and you're reinforcing the old pathway so when you do this have realistic goals now, this is only as a tool to train your prefrontal cortex. Obviously, further down the line, you probably want to get to a place where you can reduce the amount of donuts you have every day or every other day or whatever. But just play around with that as a start to see how far can you get, how much can you plan, and is it easy to do it? Maybe it takes the joy out of actually eating this food when you can't do it um, when you get the craving. 
because tomorrow when you're going to have your 10 donuts, maybe you don't want donuts, maybe you want pizza, but you can't have pizza because you planned for eating donuts. So if you're going to have something that day that is donut or nothing. And for some people that is just driving them crazy, but it's really, really important that we get into the habit of using our prefrontal cortex to plan and, and do what, and basically f force us to do what we want us to do. Because we have these conflicting desires. We have one desire to eat in the moment, and then we have the other desire to not eat any sugar because of whatever your reason is to not eat sugar. I have, I have many reasons to not eat sugar. So take that as an exercise. Just think about it. Think about what you want to do tomorrow if you want to have any sugar and what type of sugar that's going to be. So if you're going to eat a chocolate cake, decide what type of chocolate cake it is, when you're going to have it, and how much of it you are going to eat.